The message tonight will be 131B, if you can put a number like that on it, Roger. And our message is in 1 Corinthians 15. If you have your Bibles, we'll read there together. This entire chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 is on the resurrection of the body. Paul starts this chapter by, first of all, establishing the truth that there must be a resurrection of the believer's body, and that in that resurrection there must be a change made in it. On Sunday morning, the purpose of our message was to show you the desperate need of a change being made in our bodies. Though we have been saved and our sins have been forgiven us for his name's sake, and though the precious blood of Christ has settled everything in the sight of God in regards to our sins and our iniquities and our transgressions, still there is a change that must be made in our bodies. Paul speaks of it in Romans 8 as the redemption of our bodies. Our bodies are not fit for heaven. We are possessed of a wicked nature resident in our bodies. We are described in this chapter as corruptible, mortal, dishonored, weak, feeble, diseased, powerless. These bodies are decaying. They are dying. There is something wrong within them. And Paul argues in this chapter that they must be changed, and they must be made fit for the presence of the Lord. And this is precisely what the Lord is going to do when he comes for us. So I'd like to begin reading at verse 51, where Paul unfolds the mystery. <clears throat> Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. <clears throat> o death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. According to Paul's language in this chapter, the change that will take place in the believer's body will take place at the last trump. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul teaches that the last trump will accompany the descent of the Lord from heaven. He teaches that this will be the personal appearing of the Lord Jesus himself, and that when he comes out of heaven, he will cause an instantaneous change to take place in the believer's body. It matters not whether this believer's body has been sleeping in the grave or whether he is still occupying that body for the change to take place. The living shall be caught up, the bodies of the sleeping saints shall be raised, and in a moment the twinkling of an eye they shall all be changed. This word change Paul uses frequently in his writings. It means to give a different appearance. It means to change the order. It means to change uh, the uh, component parts of that body. Something is going to happen to us physically in the rapture. He describes that change in words in this chapter like incorruptible. Our bodies will be made incorruptible, immortal, glorious, powerful, spiritual, and heavenly. 
in verse 47, he refers to Jesus as the Lord from heaven. In verse 49 and 50, he tells us that we shall bear the image of the heavenly. So he plainly teaches the body is that we shall be transformed and made into the image of Jesus, the heavenly one. In 1 John chapter 3, if you'll turn there, you'll see that John says the same thing. At verse 1 he says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And from John's passage here, we have these tremendous facts. All who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, all who have known the love of God in Jesus Christ, are now at this present time called the sons of God. This accounts for all of their difficulty in the world. The world doesn't know them because they are sons of God. The world doesn't know them because it didn't know him. How then could it know us in whom he dwells? We are now the sons of God. The proof of it is our rejection daily by the world. Another thing is obvious, John says. We are not now like we shall be. It hasn't yet been made clear to us, John says, exactly what we will be like. But we do have this much light on the subject. When Jesus appears, when we see him, we will be made like him, because we for the first time shall see him as he really is. And this should work something in the heart of the believer. John says what it should work is this, every man that hath this hope in him. It means that every man who has this hope set on Jesus purifies himself even as he is pure. The blessed hope of seeing Jesus at any moment and being made like him as we see him as he is should have a purifying effect upon the people of God. We should long to be made pure as he is pure, and it should work a hope in our hearts that nothing else can work. And if I haven't learned anything else in these past few messages on the rapture, I've learned with the heart a truth that I've known for a number of years in the head, that the blessed hope of the rapture is not merely the event of the Lord's coming. It is not even meeting him and being caught away from the world and escaping our problems and our pressures and our circumstances. The blessed hope is this thing that I preach about tonight, the prospect of having our bodies changed, the prospects of being made fit for heaven, the prospects of having something happen to us that will enable us to know and love and enjoy the presence of the Lord as we've never been able to know and love and enjoy that presence before. Paul in Philippians 3 speaks of our bodies as those vile bodies of humiliation. And today the Lord showed me again and again how vile our bodies really are and how much they really do humiliate us in the sight of the Lord. It is our body that interrupts our fellowship with him. It is our body that works from lust within and pressure without that often turns sweet fellowship with the Lord into a miserable, wretched walk in the flesh. It is our bodies that have constantly humiliated us. 
when in those times of fellowship with the Lord, oftentimes like Peter, we've made those foolish vows and promises about what we would do and what we would not do again, only to find that our bodies have humiliated us, and the nature of sin which dwells within has ensnared and trapped us again. What a glad day it will be when all opposition from within me is put down, when the old man of sin actually and literally dies and dies forever, when I am released, Paul says in Romans 8, from this bondage of corruption to the liberty of the glory that there is in Christ. This is the blessed hope, and this is the purifying hope of all God's people. And so John teaches in his passage that we are to be made like him. And it hadn't appeared to John yet just what that would mean. So it would be foolish for me to tell you that I know exactly and perfectly what the resurrection body will be like. The whole subject in the New Testament is shrouded in mystery. In the very best language Paul can muster up, back in 1 Corinthians 15 again, he tries to liken it to different illustrations in nature. But it is a mysterious subject. He says the resurrection body will be different, our bodies will be changed, and yet, in a sense, they will be the same. They will be like our old bodies, yet they will be different. The whole subject seems paradoxical. John, I repeat, confessed and was forced to confess that it didn't appear to him just what those bodies would be like. But this much he was sure, when we see Jesus as he really is, we'll be made like him. In Philippians 3, Paul says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we look for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change these vile bodies and fashion them like unto his glorious body. So this much we know, our vile bodies of humiliation are going to be fashioned, fashioned like the glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I believe that these scriptures teach that our resurrection bodies will be identical to the resurrection body of the Lord Jesus. Now, the resurrection body of the Lord Jesus we will examine tonight. It was a mysterious body, a body like no human being ever had before. I read of no human in the Bible who ever had a body like the Lord Jesus had at his resurrection. He had a real body, a very real body. If you'll turn, please, to John chapter 20. Verse 16, and read with me. On the morning of the resurrection, he met Mary near the sepulcher, and in verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, and she turned herself, and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus said, Touch me not. For I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. So he had a body that was real, for he urged Mary not to touch him. Therefore it was a body that could be touched, for later in the upper room he offered to let Thomas touch it. He told Thomas he could touch the wounds in his hands with his finger if he liked, that he could take his hand and thrust it into the wound in the side if he pleased. There is no Bible record that Thomas ever did that, but Jesus offered to let him do it. He was real, and Mary recognized him, and so real that when he ascended forty days and nights later from the Mount of Olivet, those two heavenly witnesses who stood after his departure into the clouds said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? The same Jesus, 
which is taken up from you shall return again or come again in like manner as ye have seen him go. In the 24th of Luke, if you'll look back there for a moment, at the 31st verse, the Emmaus disciples met him on the Emmaus road. Now their eyes were holden, the scripture says, that they should not know him. But later he revealed himself to them. And in verse 31 it says, Their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. In verse 36, he appeared later at Jerusalem, and this is what he said, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. They did not see a spirit, they just supposed they had for they were not expecting to see him. <clears throat> and he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Verse 38 tells me that the thoughts that troubled these disciples were the thoughts of him being a spirit. They just couldn't believe that he was real, that he really had flesh and really had bone like they had. And they were terrified and affrighted when they saw him, for they didn't know anything about the resurrection of the body. And they thought that he was only a spirit and had taken some form that they could see. And he said, I know what your hearts are troubled about. I know why you are afraid. You think that I'm a spirit. Now look at my hands and my feet and see that it is I myself. Handle me and see. A spirit has no flesh. A spirit have, has no bone. So in his hands and in his feet, he had some identification marks that identified him as he himself, their Lord Jesus. Those identifying marks were, of course, the wounds that were made at the cross of Calvary. Had it not been for those blessed wounds, these disciples would never have recognized the Lord of glory. They would have gone away saying, we've seen a spirit, we've seen a ghost. But they could not say it again, for they had seen the Lord. There was only one who had the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet. So we have established so far this truth. In the rapture, our bodies will be changed and made like his. They will be exactly, Paul says, like his glorious body. His glorious body was flesh. His glorious body was bone. His glorious body could be handled by his friends. He could be seen and he could be recognized. He was in a real body, made of flesh and bone like our flesh and like our bone. Mary recognized him. Mary Magdalene recognized him. The eleven recognized him. Five hundred brethren at once saw him and knew him. So his body was real, it was actual, it was physical, it could be handled, it could be touched, it could be recognized, it could take food, although it need not take it. In order to show them how real he was, <clears throat> he partook of some food to demonstrate and to settle their troubled hearts and to convince them beyond any shadow of a doubt that the same Jesus occupied the same body, yet a different body, than he had once occupied before. There was another strange capacity to this body that he occupied. Seemingly, he had the ability to be visible or invisible at will. When he walked with the Emmaus disciples, he caused them so they could not see him. 
and they walked all the way to Emmaus and never seen Jesus. They knew they were walking with a stranger, but they didn't know him. He appeared, yet the form in which he appeared caused them not to know him. Then at Emmaus he opened their eyes, and they saw him. This indicates to me that there was no real change in him, but a change in them. There was a change in them so that first they could not see him, then they could see him and know him. It's an interesting thing that during forty days and nights, in which he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs, we have not a single record of any unbeliever ever seeing the law. We have a record of over five hundred brethren at once who saw him, but no unbeliever ever saw the Lord Jesus. Yet he moved freely about the area, teaching and preaching and expounding the great truths of God to his disciples. And during these forty days and nights when he was present with them, they undoubtedly were telling everyone they knew that Jesus was alive and they had been with him and they had seen him. Yet not a single unbeliever ever saw him. Another strange thing about the body of the Lord is found in that passage in Luke 24 where he said, Look, handle me and see. Does a spirit have flesh and bone? So he identified uh, the composition of his body as being flesh and bone, but no mention is ever made of any blood in that body. Now there is a good reason for that. First of all, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.50, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. No blood will ever come into the presence of God. The only blood that was ever taken into the presence of God, and the only blood that will ever be allowed in the presence of God, is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This blood he shed at Calvary's cross. This blood he gave up in his death at the cross. And the book of Hebrews teaches that he, as the high priest of heaven, took this blood into the holy place of heaven and sprinkled it on the mercy seat and obtained by the sprinkling of that blood an eternal redemption for us. Jesus has no blood in his resurrection body. His blood was shed and carried to the mercy seat in heaven. Well, how then does he live? He has flesh and he has bone. How can flesh and bone exist without blood? First of all, he has no need of blood. The purpose of the blood simply is to carry nourishment and to carry life to the decaying cells and the decaying tissue of our bodies. If you withhold the supply of life-giving blood to any part of your body, that part of that body will die. If you cut off the blood circulation to your arm, soon it will die and be useless and will have to be removed. Stop the flow of blood to your brain and your brain after a while will be damaged beyond repair. Blood flows into every part of the human body, carrying nourishment, carrying life, and strength to decaying cells and tissue. God said in his word in Leviticus 17.11 that the life of this flesh is in the blood. We have a life principle which we receive by tradition from our fathers. The life principle in my body tonight is the principle of the blood, and this blood I received by tradition from my father, and he received his blood from his father, and he received his blood from his father, and so forth, back to Father Adam, from whom all of us derive our life and our blood. 
Adam's blood was spoiled. It was corruptible. It was diseased. It was abomination in the sight of God. For this blood that flowed in Adam's vein carried sin. And by the transmission of that blood, sin has entered into the entire human family. It is necessary in the resurrection that we have a new life principle. Now, Jesus has no blood, not because his blood was diseased, but because his blood was incorruptible, and because his blood was eternal and holy and sinless. Therefore, his blood has been placed upon the mercy seat, and our blood will of necessity be removed. I suppose you're wondering how in the world we're going to live without blood. Reading in the book of Revelation, I discovered this. The saints in heaven will never hunger. The saints in heaven will never thirst. The saints in heaven will never know sickness. The saints in heaven will never know death. And it says of the New Jerusalem where we shall live, there is no night there. Now when you think about those things, you will discover this about our resurrection bodies. We will never hunger, so we will never need food. Our bodies will never have to be nourished by food again. We will never thirst, so our bodies will never need take on drink again. We will never grow weary, never grow exhausted, never need sleep, so there will be no night there. And because our bodies will be changed and no longer corruptible or diseased or in need of nourishment and strength, there will never be any sickness, and if never any sickness, there shall never be any death. Death will be swallowed up in victory. And the victory is this, God is going to change our bodies so that death will hold no claim on those resurrection bodies. And if death holds no claim, no ultimate, final claim, then he holds no momentary claim as he does now in each of us. When we were born, we began to die. We began to die because death holds claim on every mortal body. Death holds claim on every corruptible man. But when death is swallowed up in victory, there will be no ultimate claim, there will be no daily claim, there will be no need of life-giving blood in our bodies. We will be possessed of a new life principle. What is that new life principle? Better say it this way, who is that new life principle? That new life principle is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is in us the hope of glory. And in that day when we are glorified, it will be Christ in us who will possess us of newness of life. Now, the resurrection body of the Lord Jesus had a different outer expression. He was clothed differently than he had ever been clothed before at the resurrection. I've never given too much thought to this, but it is something interesting, and I have several interesting things to share with you tonight that I'm not sure I can hook together to make any meaning out of, but they're interesting enough to pass on to you. This is one of them. The only earthly possession the Lord Jesus had when he was crucified was a seamless robe. This robe was taken from him at the cross of Calvary. He was crucified naked. When the robe was taken from him, soldiers gathered at the foot of his cross and gambled for it. When he was dead and taken from the cross by his friends, they wrapped him in grave clothes. They covered his face with a napkin. 
They put him in Joseph's sepulcher, and they sealed that tomb. But on the morning of the resurrection, as it began to come daylight, and the disciples began to drift in to come to the tomb and bring spices, the tomb had been opened, not to let Jesus out, but to let the disciples in, that they might see that he was gone, that he was not there, that he had risen. And one of the first miracles they discovered was that the grave clothes were still there. They were in their proper place. You remember the messages on the resurrection. They were like a cocoon. They undoubtedly held the same form, the same shape of the Lord Jesus' body. The napkin was folded neatly in his place. But he himself was gone. It was only an empty cocoon, and Jesus was gone. I personally do not believe that he had any need of clothing. If he had had any need of clothing, he surely must have worn those grave clothes or gone after that robe. But we have no mention of the Lord Jesus being clothed in his resurrection body. Now we will go back for just a moment in our minds to Adam and Eve. When Adam was created, he was made in the likeness of God. It's too much of a discussion to expound the various words in Genesis that describe Adam's condition. But there is one word that tells us that he resembled God. Now God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Yet Adam had a body. So there must have been some physical resemblance that likened Adam to God, and yet it's a mystery how that could be since God had no body. But there is a passage in the book of Psalms, in the 104th Psalm, and in the first two verses, where the psalmist speaks of God as clothing himself with light like a garment. And he describes God as being clothed or swathed in light. And this light came from his inner source of glory, so that God put on outwardly what he was inwardly. And you recall that it is said of Adam and Eve that they resembled God, and they were naked, and they were what? Unashamed. You say, well, they were unashamed because nakedness had no particular meaning to them at the time. They had never sinned. That's possibly true and probably true. Yet there is another reason for it. They were naked as we think of nakedness, yet they were clothed, for they resembled God. And I believe that they were clothed in a garment of light, as God was clothed in a garment of light, for he made them like himself, and he made them to walk with him and to have fellowship with him. And when Adam sinned, he lost that ability. He lost that power to manifest the glory of God in his body, for he fell into a state of sin and depravity. Now, there is other evidence that leads me to believe that this is correct. If you look at the 17th chapter of Matthew for a moment, you will have the story of the transfiguration. Verse 1 reads, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias, talking with him. The word for transfigured in the original is metamorphosis. It's the word used to describe the process of a caterpillar turning into a moth. 
when he finally puts on outwardly what he had been inwardly all the time, it is said that a metamorphosis has occurred. And that's what the word actually means. It means to put on outwardly or to adorn yourself outwardly with that adornment that you have within. So what happened plainly and simply on the Mount of Transfiguration was that the eternal Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who possessed the glory of God from an eternity past, suddenly, in the presence of his disciples, clothed himself in glory. He metamorphosed himself, or put on outwardly, what he really was inwardly and what he had been all the time. And when this miracle took place, his face did shine as the sun. Now that's quite a statement. Did you ever see the sun on a bright day? Did you ever see a desert sun on a bright day? You couldn't possibly look at the sun long without protection, without going blind. Man can't even approach to the light of the sun, let alone to the unapproachable light of the glory of God. And the nearest that Matthew could come to describing what Jesus looked like when he metamorphosed himself or put on outwardly the raiment that he wore within, the glory of God, was that his face did shine like the sun. Another writer describing the same miracle said it shone like the sun in its strength, like the sun at noonday, like the sun in all of its power and all of its strength, and his raiment was white as the light. Something happened to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, and what happened to him was this. Ahead of time, and for prophecy only, he put on for a moment the glorified body that he would wear after the resurrection. He transfigured himself. His clothing wasn't changed. Nothing physical or material was changed about him. But suddenly he was clothed in glory and clothed in light. And he was manifesting what he really was, the Son of God and the glorious and glorified Son of God. Now, if you will look, look to Luke, chapter 9, where the transfiguration is given again. Verse 28 says, And it came to pass, about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his deceits, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. The word altered means to put on something other than what he had on. And it was the fashion of his countenance, or the likeness of his appearance, that was altered. He put on a different outward expression. It caused his raiment to appear white and glistering. It caused his face to shine like the sun in her strength. And appearing with him there in that glory were two people who had been dead for centuries of time, Moses and Elijah. And they shared for a moment in the transfiguration the coming glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we will share it in the day of his coming. And I think this is one of the most wonderful pictures of the eternal relationship and the eternal fellowship of God's people with Christ that we have anywhere in the New Testament. In the day that Jesus comes, we will share his glory. Because he is transfigured, we will be transfigured too. Because he is changed, we will be changed too. Because he lives, we shall live also. 
because his face shines with the glory of God, ours shall shine also. And because he appeared white and glistering, we shall appear white and glistering also. And what shall we be doing? We will be doing what Moses and Elijah was doing also. We will be engaged in an eternal fellowship with Jesus Christ around the subject of his death, his decease at Jerusalem. Now this brings up some other questions. The other questions are these. How could we stand an eternity of that kind of fellowship? It may sound desirable at the moment, but let us be realists. Let us be practical. <laughs> How could we stand an eternity of that kind of fellowship? I'm convinced more and more that our minds are indeed a part of our bodies. They are corrupted too, so the scriptures teach. And our minds get tired just like our bodies get tired. And our minds have to be rested just like our bodies must be rested. Our minds must be treated as our bodies are treated oftentimes. And we cannot ignore those minds any more than we can ignore our bodies. We must take care of them. There are times in this life when we grow weary in our minds. So weary it's hard to think, hard to concentrate, hard to keep our line of thought, hard to keep from being distracted. And I've wondered how for an eternity could we keep our minds, could we keep our hearts fixed on Jesus? How will it be possible that for an eternity we could carry on moment by moment, hour after hour, year after year, and age after age, an eternal fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ? It will be possible because he's going to change our bodies. And when he changes our bodies, Paul says that this change will make our bodies spiritual. Once he says they were natural bodies, but in the change they will be made spiritual bodies. Natural bodies means that they are controlled by the soul, subject to the limitations of the flesh, subject to the limitations of the mind, subject to the limitations of all that we have been limited in because of our descendancy from Adam. But when Jesus transforms us and transfigures us, the natural will have no part in our bodies. We will be spiritual bodies. Yes, they will be bone and flesh and real and recognizable. And we will know and we will be known as we know and are known here. We will certainly not know any less in heaven than we know here. But the wonderful change will make our bodies so that it will be possible for them to be wholly and solely controlled forever by the Holy Spirit of God. I don't think any man in a mortal body, in a corruptible body, in a natural body like we have now, could stand the fullness of the Holy Spirit very long at one time. His mind wouldn't stand it. His body couldn't possibly stand it. For he is natural, he is corruptible, he is mortal, he is feeble and diseased and weak. But in that day when our bodies are changed, it will be possible for us to be controlled by the Holy Spirit forever. Can you think of what fullness of joy that will be? The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and etc. Read them in Galatians 5, and you will have an idea of what you're going to experience throughout eternity. Eternal love. You will never know a time 
when you love anything or anyone any less than with the fullness of the love of God. This answers forever the questions, how can I be happy in heaven when my loved ones are gone? You will be happy in heaven because all of your loved ones will be there. The only ones you will have capacity to love will be those who are of the family of God. All earthly ties will be gone, for our natural bodies will disappear, our bodies will become spiritual, and the love we know will be the love of God for the saints of God throughout eternity. Read the fruit of the Spirit and you will have an idea of what eternity will be like. Eternity of peace, an eternity of fullness of joy. No rise and fall in the crest of our joy. No fluctuation in our peace that passes all understanding. To be filled at last with the fullness of God. To be filled at last with the glory of Christ. To know at last Holy Spirit fullness forever and never to know anything less than that is indeed to me a description of heaven that satisfies me until we see what else is there. Does it you? Stephen, under the fullness of the Holy Spirit for just a few moments, it is said in the Bible that his face shone like the face of an angel. It was said of Moses when he came down from the mount after being with God forty days and nights, in the presence of the Word of God and in the presence of the glory of God, he came away with a face that shone so brightly. The outward manifestation of the glory of God in Moses was so great that the people had to put a veil over his face, for they dared not to look into the face of Moses. What then will it be like when our bodies are changed so that we will have the physical capacity to stand the fullness of God's glory and the fullness of his Spirit and the fullness of himself throughout eternity. What a glorious and wonderful change it will be. Every limitation that we have known here in our fellowship will disappear. In those rare moments, and they are rare indeed, considering all of the other moments of our life, in those rare moments here, when we are in fellowship with Jesus, when we know his joy flooding our souls, the reality of his love and of his presence and his peace, those few fleeting moments will become our eternal experience. And Peter now describes those experiences as a joy that is unspeakable and full of what? Glory. So it will be like this. Our bodies will be changed. They will be spiritual bodies, yet flesh and bone bodies that are real and can be touched and handled and recognized, yet made so spiritual that they will manifest the glory of God throughout eternity will be clothed in light as he is clothed in light, and will reflect the transfigured glory of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, there is another mystery about the resurrection body, and I don't know whether I should even touch on it because it's so mysterious to me that I'm sure, I'm real sure that I can't explain it. However. In the 1 Corinthians 15, Paul uses three examples from nature, trying to describe what the resurrection body will be like. He uses the example of seed. He says, you sow seed in the ground and it dies. Then seed comes forth. Now the seed is like that seed that was planted, yet it is not the same seed. That seed corrupted and decayed and died. Yet the new seed that came out, came out of that corruption, came out of that death, 
came out of that seed that was sown and is seen no more. That has to be the meaning of our resurrection bodies, for this is how Paul describes them. Our bodies, when they are buried, that's the meaning of the word bury, is they are sown. These bodies decay and corrupt, decompose, go back to dust. Yet out of that dust, out of that same body that died, out of that same corruption, the victory of this change will be that a body shall come that is incorruptible and without decay and without death. Who can explain the miracle of a seed coming to life? No one. Who can explain the miracle of the resurrection body? Then he says it is like flesh. The beasts have one kind of flesh. The birds have another kind of flesh, he says. Yet it's all flesh, but they put on an outward manifestation that differs. Now, the flesh of a beast and the flesh of a man is no different. It just looks different. It just appears different and has a little different organization and a little different arrangement on the outside. Then he uses the subject of celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. And he says they look different too, but they're all bodies. Now, the resurrection body from these three examples apparently is going to have a new arrangement, a new organization, or a new order. Now, I'll tell you what I believe. I'm not sure that I can establish this beyond any controversy. You may have many questions that I will never be able to answer, but there is a mystery about the body of the Lord Jesus. Look in John chapter 20 first, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace, be still. In the 26th verse it says, After eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut. In Luke 24, you need not turn there, but in verse 36 and 37, you will read the same words, the same occurrence, during his resurrection appearances. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't put any idle words in the Bible, yet he emphasizes three times in these resurrection appearances that Jesus suddenly appeared in a place that was securely locked to keep people out. The Holy Spirit says that the hall or the room where they met was locked for fear of the Jews. And if that be true, then the place was secure so that no human beings could get into that place. Now, if I wanted to secure this hall to keep the rest of the people of Marietta out, I would make sure that all the windows were locked and all the doors were locked and bolted so that once we were inside, we would be satisfied that no human being would enter this hall until we left. This is what they did in the upper room Yet suddenly, Jesus appeared in their midst. Three times, locked doors and windows are no obstacle to the resurrection body of the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not recall, there may be, but I do not recall any evidence in the Scripture where he manifested any ability like that before his resurrection. During his earthly life, he was subject to to all of the limitations of a human body. He grew tired like we grow tired. He slept like we slept. He ate as we eat. He walked, grew weary, was thirsty, hungry. He wept. He was in every way a real man, occupying a body like ours, with one exception. His body did not have the corruptible nature of Adam. Yet in the resurrection, there has come a change 
in the arrangement of Jesus' body, a change in the order and the construction of his body, so that a solid wall represents no obstacle to him. Also, I note in his resurrection appearances that he seems to have the ability to be here one moment and someplace else the next. He suddenly transports himself almost at the speed of light from one place to another. As he spoke in Jerusalem, that is, right outside of Jerusalem, in the garden that morning, he said, Go tell my disciples that I go before them in Galilee. Yet he was miles and miles and miles from Galilee, yet he intended to be with them in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. I think the simple explanation is that Jesus was in the fourth dimension in his resurrection body. Now you know that the basic principles in this atomic understanding that we have in the atomic age today is that all matter in the universe is composed of atoms. Now they have made an amazing discovery in atomic research. They have discovered that what we thought were solids all this time are not solids at all. They say that all matter is made up mostly of empty space, and matter forms around that empty space. If you can't understand it, join the club. I can't understand it either. Nevertheless, they have proven this scientifically to be a fact. For instance, a bar of steel appears solid. It appears heavy. In its analysis, it is mostly space. But the number of protons in the element involved in steel makes it appear heavy and makes it appear solid. It appears solid for another reason. It is composed of atoms. Atoms are tiny particles too small to be seen with the human eye. They are tiny solar systems, just like our solar system. They have a nucleus. The nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons. And around this nucleus, by some tremendous force that science has never analyzed yet, but we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ, flow electrons. Now, resident in the nucleus or the nuclei of all atoms, is tremendous power. When excited and released, when that atom is split, its power and energy is released. And if that chain reaction is not stopped, would cause all other atoms to be split and the entire universe to be destroyed. Now the reason that this death seems solid to me is because the atoms in my body and the atoms in this desk collide upon contact. It is not a collision of matter, it is a collision of force. So this is a scientific principle. This desk composed of mostly space appears solid to me. My hand composed mostly of space appears solid to the desk. It appears solid because the atomic construction of my hand and the atomic construction of this desk are identical. The arrangement is the same. Our atoms collide upon contact. This is the reason I cannot walk through that brick wall. But if an ever so slight change an arrangement were made in my body, so that these building blocks of atoms were changed in their sequence. I could pass through that wall tonight without injury. In fact, I would be in a world and a dimension all my own. I would never be limited again to time, space, or matter, and I would be free forever from the third dimension world I was born into and am confined in at this present moment. 
This, I am sure, is something of the change that will take place in our resurrection bodies. To be able to be present wherever we will, whenever we will, will be a part of our capacity. To be unhindered by time, thank God for that. To be unhindered by space, thank God for that. Distance will be nothing, and matter will be nothing. No obstacles will ever stand in our way again. We will pass from a world limited to the natural and limited to the flesh to a world unlimited, a heavenly world, where we shall bear the image of the heavenlies. Then I must close, but there's some interesting things yet. My. I was studying today where um, Jesus in Revelation 1.18 says, I am the first and the last. Well, if you'll get a good lexicon someplace and look up that word first, you'll be amazed. Do you know what it is? The word in the original is proton. I am the proton. Now, all elements have various numbers of protons in their nucleus. For instance, uranium has 92 protons in its nucleus. But there is one element known to man that has just one proton. And Jesus doesn't say, I am 92 protons. He says, I am the proton. What element carries one proton? Hydrogen. <laughs> We're all going to be made into hydrogen? Well, what's so unusual about hydrogen? Well, I didn't think there was anything unusual about it. I thought, that's far enough. Let's quit there while we're ahead. But I looked up the word hydrogen. You know what hydro means, don't you? It has to do with water. And gen has to do with generation. And hydrogen simply and literally means born of water. And that has something to do with every saved man in the world, doesn't it? Oh, not literal water. Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except he be hydrogen, water born, he cannot see the kingdom of God, because hydrogen derives all of its power and all of its force and all of its existence from the proton. And the proton is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the proton, the first. And only those who are born again find in him that life which will one day place them in this fourth dimension world where all is heavenly, where all is spiritual, and where God in all of his fullness and all of his glory will not only be made known to us, will be manifest in us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the light of thy word for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is that light and who is that word. And we pray tonight, Father, that you would encourage our hearts by hearing thy word on the glory that shall be revealed to us in that day when we behold the glory which thou hast revealed in him. Bless, Father, thy word tonight in the hearts of those who heard it, May it work good for us and glory for thyself. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Lord bless you.